Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Kitsap Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Whoever you are and wherever you come from, for this hour, we here are one congregation, joined together as one. I invite you to follow along in the order of service. For those of you attending virtually, all the links for this service, including the order of service, are on our website and in this morning's worship service email. If you are here in the sanctuary this morning, please silence your cell phones. My name is Robin Singh, and I've been a member of KUUF since 2019. I've served on various uh, committees, and I'm a current board member, and I have led a meditation group, and I was also on the ministerial search committee. Our worship leader this morning is the Reverend Dr. Sandra, or Sandy Bakanak. Reverend Bakanak is a retired hospice counselor, ordained MCC clergy person, which is Metropolitan Community Church, nurse, and former military chaplain. She has walked labyrinths since 1999 for personal wellness, meditation, and pleasure, including with our past minister, the Reverend Suzelle Lynch. I'd like to welcome any visitors. If you are here in person, we look forward to welcome you, welcoming you outside after the service. If you are attending virtually, please introduce yourselves after the service at our Zoom coffee hour. Everyone is welcome to attend our Zoom coffee hour directly after the service. The link is in the email that went out this morning and will show on your screen following the worship service. You will need to use the password COFFEE with a capital C to be admitted to the coffee hour. Announcements are available on our website, www.kuuf.org, or in our weekly email newsletter, The Candle. And we have one special announcement from the board and the selection committee. So next Sunday, August 7th, we will welcome our new minister, Reverend Crystal Zerfoss. She will introduce herself during the worship service, and we will have an opportunity to meet her after the service at a potluck hosted by the Board and Selection Committee. Reverend Crystal will be speaking from the pulpit in September. In the meantime, stay tuned for more announcements of opportunities to meet her informally and online. And now we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish people. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here the Suquamish live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliot Treaty of 1855. Please enjoy our musical call to worship, Building a New Way, sung by the UUSGU Choir. It's also uh, number 1017 in our Teal Hymnal. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. We are building a new way, feeling stronger every day.
Well, I know you're not clapping for me. You're clapping for that <laughs> rollicking music. How wonderful. So uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Sandy, and just thank you for having me here today. Uh, our opening words come from one of my absolutely favorite labyrinth authors and builders. He's retired now. Uh, if you'd like to invest in books, anything by Robert Foray is a win. And this is what he writes about the labyrinth as a spiritual tool. The labyrinth is a spiritual tool. It is an effective spiritual tool, generic in nature and personal in application. Most people who walk a labyrinth see the metaphor at once. It is like the twist and the turns of their journey through life. This analogy can be carried further. The way we walk the labyrinth both reflects and affects how we see ourselves and our world. A labyrinth is universal, that is having a single path, with no choices or intersections, the path leads unfailingly, though securitously, to the center. Mazes, on the other hand, have multiple paths and myriad choices, most of which lead nowhere. Thank you very much. And now for our opening words. Join me now in lighting our chalice. If you have your own candle or chalice at home, please light it as I read our chalice lighting words by the Reverend Dr. Lauren R. Tress from Veriditas. Walking the labyrinth clears the mind and gives insight into the spiritual journey. It urges action. It calms people in the throes of life transitions it helps them see their lives in the context of a path, a pilgrimage. They realize that they are not human beings on a spiritual path, but spiritual beings on a human path. Please join me now in the spoken affirmation. The words will appear on the screen. We gather as a caring community seeking life's deeper meanings. We value diversity and affirm the worth of all living things. We strive to speak truth in love, to act for justice, to grow in spirit, and to care for the earth. We celebrate with open hearts and minds the creative power that sustains and transforms us. And now, Melinda Hughes, our Director of Religious Education, and Reverend Bakanak will share a special activity for our time for all ages. Everyone is invited to join in. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a little different this morning. Usually I'm telling a story, but you know what? There are no children's stories on reference. One. And two, I thought it would be fun for everybody to have an opportunity to create their own labyrinth. So when you came in this morning, you were given a little pencil and a piece of paper, and we have hymnals there that you can use, kind of as a hard thing to draw on. And by the time we're done, hopefully, everybody will have their own personal labyrinth that looks like this. And Jenny, what was that word you told me? I know I heard her say it. Unicursal. Unicursal. I learned that this week. Universal. So one way in and one way out. So this is what you're going to have when we're done. May right. I ask you one yes, please. So, so kids, I'm really depending on you. We're depending on you to help your parents and the adults because usually you'll learn it a lot faster these patterns than they will. They'll probably need a little bit of help. <laughs> right. And, and Mike said that if you're online and at home, hopefully you can grab a pencil, pen, paper, something to draw with. And he said. If it's Melinda talking, you should have no problem hearing. So, <laughs> so we're going to get started. So, this is what I do in my classroom. They have their pencil and their paper. Here we go. So, I am about two thirds of the way down, not at the very top because you'll run out of room. Um, and you're going to, on the slides, there's going to be slides. The 
The red is what I'm drawing. So we'll go ahead and flip to that first slide so you'll see. And you'll see the red part is the new part. So there we go. So about two thirds of the way down, you're going to draw a plus. Big plus sign. Yes. Now don't overcomplicate this. Okay. Just a plus. Plus. <laughs> plus. Okay. And next, you're going to draw, I said L's, but they're not all shaped like L's, but you're going to draw these lines in. Yes, 90 degree angles. Yes, 90 degree angles all the way around. Thank you. Yes. We'll pause. I'm watching. Just like a teacher. I'm seeing. I still see pencils moving. People are still drawing. Then, you're going to put a dot in each of these corners. And may I say yep. something? So knowing this basic pattern predates Christianity by at least a thousand years. And it's so easy, easy to draw. It's been found throughout the antiquity in many countries and continents because of its simplicity. So you're all going to learn how to be labyrinth drawers by the end of this. All right, and this is the part that starts being a little more tricky. But you're going to start the middle line, right? So you start here at the middle, and you're going to kind of make a rounded connection to the first, to the first one. Yep. And you're going to make a little bump. And this is where it starts. You might be like my students and see a pattern, and you might work ahead. Okay, so then you're going to move one to the left, and you're going to draw a rounded connection to the dot. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Then you're going to go one more to the left, and what do you think we're going to do? Draw a rounded connection to the other. Dot. Draw a rounded connection to the next one. So we're going to go one to the left. We're going to go around to the next one on the right. I hear it. I hear it. And again, I'm going to move one to the left. One to the left, and I'm going to circle around to the next one on the right. So we'll pause if people get a chance here. And, and for adults, if you're getting a little, little discombobulated, you can stop right here, and the kids will help you from this point. <laughs> Okay, so we're just going to keep following that pattern. We're going to start with the next free one on the left, drawing a big loop to the next free one on the right. Now, so this one is, oops, this one's the, 
a left-handed one, right? Because yes. it enters on the left. So you could do, for those of you who like to do engineering math for people on these scientific things, you could do it the opposite way that we just did it, and it would enter on the right. And, and some people, we learned at Sandy's workshop, some people like to have both of those, and they go like this at one time. Yes. Yes. So they do both of them at once. Yeah. So. And, and it makes a fantastic art project to be able to draw this. That's what we're going to do that. That's right. Yeah. And you can color inside, you can put stickers, you can put sparkly glitter and glue and yarn, and I'm not going to steal your But throughout antiquity, they found this pattern on pottery and coins, on walls and ancient buildings. And so I think there's something really important going on here. Very cool. Good job. You <laughs> Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to put this aside so hopefully if that was fun and everybody gets to go home with their own collaborate. And if I set this aside, we're going to go ahead and sing out those of us that are going up. Thank you, Melinda and Reverend Wakanak. Our next hymn, Find a Stillness, is a Transylvanian Unitarian hymn. The tune is named for King John Sigismund, the only UU monarch in history. He issued the Edict of Torda, which prohibited the persecution of people for religious reasons. If you look in the hymnal, you can see his name in the lower right-hand corner of page 352. Please stand as you're willing and able to sing hymn number 352, Find a Stillness. The words will also appear on the screen. Now it is time for our morning offering. If your offering is for KUUF, please put it in the envelopes in the baskets. Loose change, cash, or checks placed in the basket will go to this month's recipient of our charitable giving recipient, Bremerton Food Line. If this is your first time at KUUF, you are our guest and there is no need to contribute. Let there be an offering to strengthen and sustain our community, which is sacred to so many of us. Please enjoy this gift of music from our pianist, Brian Kenny. He will play two-part invention number four by Johann Sebastian Bach.
Now is time for our joys and sorrows. When shared together, our joys are amplified and our sorrows lessened. We have an anonymous joy. My joy is another six month checkup with oncologists went well and I'm joyful four years out. We have a sorrow from Grace and Mindy Crowley Thomas. Our dear friend AJ passed away this week at age 31. We love you and hold you in our hearts. You will be deeply missed. And we have a joy that is also a sorrow from Megan Shepherd. My joy is also a sorrow found out I have multiple ligament tears in my hip and a benign tumor in my knee. But after 15 years of pain, I finally have a diagnosis and therefore the beginnings of a plan to fix it. And we have a sorrow from Bonner. Bonner's truly saddened at the sudden and untimely passing of Sheila Worth. He was looking forward to getting to know her better from her work on the worship committee. And we have a joy from Bonner. Bonner's joy is for the potluck next week, welcoming Reverend Crystal to KUUF. And we light one last candle for those joys and sorrows that are still too tender to share. Please join me in a moment of prayer or intention. In the spirit of community in which we find strength and common purpose, we share our joys, our sorrows, our hopes, and dreams. We have turned our minds and hearts toward one another in trust, giving love, seeking comfort, and celebrating together. We are part of the web of life that makes us one with all humanity, one with all the universe. In all the moments of our lives, for those loved ones and events shared this morning, and for those we yet hold in the silence of our hearts, we are truly grateful for the love and support of this beloved community. May the spirit of life and love bring peace to us all. Amen and blessed be. Please remain seated as we sing Spirit of Life, hymn number 123 in our gray hymnal. There's no need to stand for this. For those at home, the word, words will appear on your screen. Our first reading this morning are from the words of Guerno Candelini. If life is viewed as a maze, every mistake is an unnecessary detour and a waste of time. If life is a labyrinth, then every mistake is part of the path and an indispensable master teacher. Those who travel along too quickly often hurry past the center without noticing it. The labyrinth doesn't ask, are you going the right way or the wrong way? The labyrinth asks, are you going? To go through a labyrinth is to set out on a path of transformation. 
The labyrinth invites us to discover the beauty of the whole in all the confusion, imperfection, and painfulness of life. It invites us to set out on the path with serenity and resolve. It invites us to strike out for the center and to find our way home. And now Reverend Bakanak will come up for the second reading. There. You can see I'm drinking on the job. It's water. It's not gin or anything alcoholic with the heat, trying to be safe in the heat. So uh, this reading is also from the same author, uh, Jernot Candolini. He's one of my favorite labyrinth authors. And if you enjoy these readings, anything he has written and published, I think you'd enjoy. He lives in Europe. And he and his family actually uh, traveled throughout Europe in a van, uh, exploring labyrinths in that part of the world. So he writes, ask questions. Ask, what waits for me in the middle? What, what do I meet deep in my soul? Do I move on? Do I follow the path? There's no right, no wrong, just being on the way. Just keep walking. Think about what you'd like to risk in this lifetime. The path will offer everything you need. Walk and look within. Labyrinths can be walked not only with feet, but with hands and hearts and minds. The labyrinth is an image of life, a mirror of the soul, a symbol of humanity. Much lies waiting to be discovered in it. Above all, waits oneself. Now, please join me in a moment of reflection, following, uh, followed by our music when it's time. It's such an honor to be here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've been a friend of this church probably since about 2003 or four. Uh, Reverend Suzelle Lynch and I were good buddies, especially during her sabbatical uh, when she took a year off to do art and I was on a micro budget sabbatical exploring outdoor and indoor labyrinths throughout Puget Sound. So I'm a big fan of your church, of your work, of the light that you are in Kitsap County. You are a leader in so many ways. Uh, please never underestimate the impact you have in Kitsap County and beyond. 
So there's a saying that we go into a maze to lose ourselves, but we go into a labyrinth to find ourselves. I've always loved that saying because I get lost very easily. The labyrinth helps me stay on track because I don't have to think. I just walk in and it's sort of like an out and back. And it makes me feel very secure and protected and I can relax and have some of my best thoughts and prayers and moments while I'm enjoying some simple body movement, whether it's with my feet or doing something with my hand or using an app on my phone and doing something virtually. Uh, before coming here this morning, I thought, I'm going to go online and see how many churches there are in Kitsap County uh, and how many have labyrinths. So did you know, did you know how special you are? <laughs> Let me just affirm your expertise, your passion, and this call that is, has been birthing in you to have a labyrinth on the grounds. There are 187 churches listed in Kitsap County. Seven have an outdoor labyrinth on their properties. I use my calculator because I'm not a math head. That means that this church is now one of the three or four percent that has a labyrinth. And then you have somebody who makes beautiful handcrafted labyrinths, and you have people who know how to quilt the pattern and draw the pattern and do incredibly artistic and beautiful, new, creative labyrinth designs. You, you have a gift. You have a gift, and I believe that it's eager to be shared in this area, so you are phenomenal. And now, everybody who has either been online or here in the sanctuary, you know how to draw one with that classic pattern that's been around for 5,000-ish years that predates Christianity that's easy-peasy to do. And if you're on a beach at low tide and you happen to have a nice stick, you can draw one in the sand. The tide will come up, erase it. It's very eco-friendly. If you're in the forest or a meadow and you find sticks and uh, rocks, you saw how easy it is to follow that basic pattern. You can do a temporary one right there on the spot. It's not hard. It's really easy. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, the first time I brought an indoor labyrinth here at this church was when the AIDS quilt uh, was sending panels throughout the country. They were visiting, and uh, we had AIDS uh, panels the, from the quilt all throughout this sanctuary. And at that time, I owned a 24-foot by 24-foot portable canvas with a pattern painted on it. You would, I would have to roll it up, fold it up, load it up, come to a place, move furniture, lay it down, and do that whole thing. And people did not understand what it was. They didn't know that they could walk it. They thought it was another piece of art like the, the AIDS quilt. Uh, then I brought it uh, here by invitation. Uh, again, shortly after that, not too long after that. Uh, and it was part of your Sunday service. And so that 24 by 24 foot canvas, we just moved all of the chairs out of the center area and we laid the labyrinth canvas, like the big carpet, like a rug with a path painted on it. And chairs just sort of ringed the edges. And for part of that service, we did a beloved community walk. So young and old, and there were some really young ones, and uh, just all of us, we just got up and we walked almost like a processional. We walked to the center and then we turned around and walked back out and we had that experience and it was fun. It was some people whirled and twirled, some people prayed and pondered, uh, some people just uh, would stop and uh, a thought would have them uh, in the center. Some people would kneel, some people would do a yoga, you know, they would do a sun salutation. It was really a wonderful, beloved experience to see this church in motion, in the sanctuary, all on a journey. And the beautiful thing about the labyrinth is that it provided a space where everyone was welcome. There was always room for one more. And it's such a delightful mirror of how we do life. You know, some people 
go ahead of everybody and lead the charge, and then there are others who will step aside on the path like a two-way street, and they always let people pass them. Uh, some people walked slow, some people walked fast, but we, we all were on our own journey, and yet it was in beloved community. It was just a real highlight uh, for me. The labyrinth is a really easy thing to do because it's not a maze. A maze, we know, it's designed to trick us, to stump us. You know, if you've ever done mazes in the fall in a cornfield, it's, it's there to befuddle us and we've got to use our left brain and do some problem solving and some of us will be more successful than others. If you're stressed, anxious, having a hard time concentrating, uh, trying to multitask, a maze might not be a successful experience for you. But the labyrinth, although the pattern could be different, it's always the same principle. One path in, turn around, same path out. It twists, it turns, it curves. Sometimes you're close to the center, all of a sudden, sometimes you're far away from the center, and then, boom, all of a sudden, you're inside the center. And uh, it, for some people, it can be just a magical, transformative moment. And for others, they'll say, I don't get it. <laughs> and that's the beauty of life, isn't it? Some of us, there are different things for different folks. And then you can retrace your steps out, if that feels good. And it's really just that easy. So it can help us relax, rejuvenate, de-stress. It helps us reconnect with ourselves and with others. It's great for doing a little relaxed problem solving. I've known people who have got married in them, uh, others who have had memorial services in them. Um, I've known uh, Christian churches who have used them and they've had Eucharist in the center during Lent and during Holy Week. Uh, some people use the labyrinth for a little mini retreat, do a little journaling, do a little art. Um, you know, the labyrinth can be a very useful thing. When I was working as a hospice counselor, doing a lot of phone counseling during those early COVID weeks and months where we didn't know what this thing was, there wasn't enough uh, protective equipment, it was very, very stressful, people could not go into facilities or homes to be with their loved one when they were dying. It was extremely stressful for me. And I would sit at my desk, uh, because we, we were told that we had to do phone counseling only at that point, and I would have like a little handheld labyrinth. And in between calls and sometimes during calls, I would slowly trace the pattern for myself, just as a reminder to take it slow, listen deeply, take care of myself, relieve some of that stress. And for me, it was very, very helpful. There is that wonderful saying that we've had the experiences, but we've missed the meaning. And for me, the labyrinth helps me experience a deeper meaning in life. You know, modern life, we go quick, we move, we're multitasking, we're very distracted as a society. Uh, the labyrinth has a potential, whether we walk them with our feet or with our hands or with our eyes on an app or on a computer screen, to help us slow down and be a little more reflective. You know, have a little quiet time so we can really savor and absorb, maybe figure out what some of the deeper meanings might be. Uh, experience a labyrinth for others can be really, really playful. And some of my favorite moments when I was on my micro-budget uh, sabbatical exploring about 48 or 50 outdoor labyrinths in Puget Sound, uh, I loved children in the labyrinth. Oh my gosh, they know how to whirl and twirl and dance and prance. And I would see some having a tea party in a labyrinth or playing trucks in a labyrinth or bouncing their basketball in a in a labyrinth, they would have fun. And then the adults, you know, we're, 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 we're so serious. You know, we walk, we contemplate. Um, but some would dance and move. And it's just a great way to express ourselves. I think there's a reason why for more than 4,000 years they've been around. Every continent, a ton of countries, crossing cultures, 
primitive people. Gosh, some of them would do the stone labyrinths outside. They would use stones to line the path, doing the pattern that we just did. They would have it by the coast to beseech their gods for safe return of the fishermen and for a good catch, or if it was in a farm, farming area uh, for a good harvest. Labyrinths in ancient Egypt predating Christianity have been discovered underground and, a, and above ground. Why, we really don't know, but there they are. Uh, people of all kinds of backgrounds uh, have just seemed to have a universal desire to be on the path and that pattern seems to speak to a lot of people. In our American Southwest, the indigenous people had a pattern called Man in the Maze. I have it on my earrings here. I feel like I'm a little labyrinth fashionista here. Uh, it's the only pattern that uh, we know that uh, has been invented or designed in our country, and uh, it's just beautiful. Um, Labyrinths can now be discovered, found on coins and jewelry. I have my little labyrinth necklace here. A friend from Australia had emailed me years ago and said, well, I'd like to experience a labyrinth. I don't know where they are. Can you help me? I emailed her. I said, here's, my, here's an international labyrinth locator at labyrinthsociety.org. Oh, look, there's one in your neighborhood. Oh, and it just happened to be at a retreat center that had a gift store, and that's which she sent me as a thank you. So, um, you know, so labyrinths have been around for thousands of years. Then during the Middle Ages, they became distinctively Christianized for that period in Europe. Uh, there were crusades, there were holy wars. Uh, we, we call them the pray and slay wars. You know, people of different faiths would slaughter others in the name of their deity of choice or understanding. Um, in Europe, I uh, hate to say it, but uh, those crusades were often led by religious leaders. Um, you know, convert or die, and it was just too dangerous for the everyday pilgrims to make a trip to Jerusalem. A lot of world religions encourage pilgrimage. It's good for us. So what the, the church in Rome did, they designated seven major cathedrals throughout Europe to install permanent labyrinths inside their cathedrals. And this, this was really a revolutionary thing because it empowered, it enabled the common person, the impoverished person, the um, people with physical infirmities, uh, people with very limited means, that they were able to do a local pilgrimage or something that wasn't quite as far in a safer environment. Um, the church in Rome actually encouraged pilgrims to do that. And then during that time of war, and some of them would walk them on their knees in the cathedrals. Some of them, by the time you started from the mouth of the labyrinth to the center and back, it would be like about the distance of three football fields lined. I mean, that's a long time to be praying on your knees. Uh, but people would have such powerful spiritual experiences that when uh, time settled down and there was less war, uh, the church in Rome actually dismantled some of the labyrinths and stopped encouraging people to walk them because they would have such powerful spiritual experiences that the church, Big C, could not control. I think that's kind of a wonderful thing to acknowledge, that a labyrinth can have that kind of power to impact people's lives with just the simplest of things. Uh, with that said, though, uh, one of the most beloved labyrinth patterns came from that time, and that's the Chartres pattern, uh, which we did not draw. It's a little bit more complicated, but it was symbolic. It was based on sacred geometry and a, a lot of symbolism. Uh, so it was, let's see, let's see if I can think about this, and Brian can probably tell me. Um, the rose petals in the center symbolizing creation. Uh, pilgrims believe that when they walk the labyrinth, even if it was a once in a lifetime experience, it would help them experience God as they understood God in a closer way. Uh, the, there was a cross in the center. You'd have 40 turns on the path. Uh, it was very symbolic for the 40 days of Lent with the four quadrants of 10 paths. Uh, 
People would walk them in the Middle Ages on the eve of their baptism or confirmation uh, as an aid to contemplation to Holy Week. And it was really important uh, for the church at that time for, to use that because most of the people were illiterate. The printed page was not available to them. Uh, in those great cathedrals, they would have this magnificent array of stained glass window that would tell stories from the gospel and parables and so on. And so pilgrims could walk the path, gazing deeply, really absorbing the lessons that were in the stained glass as part of their experience for life. At the end of the 13th century, um, most of those labyrinths were dismantled and the labyrinth fell into obscurity. It really, they, they were covered up. Uh, people just stopped walking them. And then about 50 years ago, the Reverend Dr. Lauren Artrez out of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, uh, she traveled to France along with some other people and uh, went to the oldest surviving medieval labyrinth, the Chartres Labyrinth, measured every millimeter to the exact specifications, came back to the United States to replicate it at Grace Cathedral, and started Veriditas, veriditas.org, which has a great worldwide free labyrinth locator. And so they have all kinds of today virtual workshops where you can even sign up for virtual hand meditations with a labyrinth and so on and so forth. Uh, before COVID, they had an active yoga on the labyrinth program. They've just recently started to resume that. I mean, I just love how they, they use their labyrinth. And then um, through veriditas.org and organizations like the labyrinthsociety.org, which is an international labyrinth society, uh, there has just been this worldwide um, renaissance, a rediscovery of labyrinths, so that now you can go anywhere in the world and just with a quick hop online and looking up at the, lo the labyrinth locator, Scotland, Africa, Chicago. I mean, it's like you, you will find an abundance of labyrinths and not all are listed, but many of them are, including a number of churches. And I bring that to your attention because uh, to have an outdoor labyrinth being one of the three to four percent here in Kitsap County, uh, that, that's something to chew on with that new minister and your labyrinth savvy and experienced people here. You know, why a labyrinth? Why here? What is its purpose? Who is it for? How are you going to build it? It's easy to spend a ton of money making them with pavers, and, but, you know, is that the look, the feel that you want? You know, so out of those churches that are here in Kitsap County, I would warmly encourage you, well, and it is warm today, on a cooler day, to experience some of those outdoor labyrinths on church properties, to talk with some of their uh, people who have made those labyrinths, who maintain the labyrinth, because making it is the easy part. Then you have maintenance, and then OMG, what is the mission, the intention of that? There are some people who'll walk them every day. It's good for their nerves. It's just a spiritual practice. It's as a, they'll, they'll walk it or do something with a labyrinth after they brush their teeth. There are other people who will make a pilgrimage to, to walk a labyrinth. Uh, it could be uh, going to Whidbey Island. There's some beautiful ones there. Or I know there's somebody here from Good Friday, um, or Friday Harbor, excuse me, and uh, one of the older a permanent labyrinths exist at that Episcopal church there. Uh, there. There are people who will go great distances to have some quiet time alone with a labyrinth. And there are some who will be so shy about it that they won't come during daylight. They'll, they'll come later when we're sleeping, in the middle of the night, sometimes to cry, to grieve, sometimes to figure something out, something, sometimes just to figure out what to do with a diagnosis. It's a very personal thing when we have a labyrinth, and it's a great gift that we offer people when we, we make it available. So I've used the labyrinth in a number of ways, and I just offer this for some consideration. 
Uh, yes, I've, I, I walk public ones when I know they're in parks or churches or community centers. Um, when my father was dying at an Idaho hospital, um, I needed to get outside and take a walk, and wouldn't you know it, that hospital had an outdoor labyrinth, and I walked it while making decisions about disconnecting his life support. It was so helpful. So much better than sitting in a stuffy room, or it just—it just was a good place to think, you know, to think, to feel, to pray. Um, I've used them in hospices, both at the bedside and for communal events, uh, memory walks. They're great for a grief resource. They're fabulous for a community interfaith walk. And I've always thought it would be very cool in Kitsap County to invite the three Abrahamic faiths the Muslim community, the Jewish community, a variety of Christian communities, and the secular community for a walk that we could just have solidarity and community as human beings. Maybe bring some non-perishable foods for a food drive. You know, I mean, it's just something that you could do because you're part of the 3% with a labyrinth. So... I've kind of rambled a little bit. I didn't stay with my notes at all, and I, I just ask your forgiveness for that, because um, I spoke with my heart. You know, the labyrinth is a dear friend. I love them. I feel safe. Um, I've seen people from all situations, circumstances, walks of life come to them and find help in their moment of need. And while it might not be for everybody, it is there for some people. And once you've experienced, then you have the experience where you can say to somebody who might benefit from that experience, have you considered walking a labyrinth? It might be helpful. And plus, they're fun. So with that, I want to thank you for having me here today. Um, I celebrate everything about you. I celebrate that you are the 3% that now has an outdoor labyrinth on your property. Rustic, yet to be finalized, but it's here. I love that you have people in the congregation who understand the labyrinth. You have the potential, being the wonderful light that you are in Kitsap County, uh, to bring the labyrinth to many people in, in this, this community. A lot of the churches that have them don't know how to use them once the initial builders and makers move on elsewhere. Uh, it could be a great community resource. You, you've got the wisdom, you've got the knowledge, you have expertise here. You know how to draw them now. So you don't need me at all. You can be very independent with that. And with that, I'm just going to close and again say just thank you very much. And as I look at our script here, please stand for our closing hymn as you are willing and able. Number 131 in our gray hymnal, Love Will Guide Us. And trust me, friends, love will guide us as we walk and experience the labyrinth.
Uh, as our service uh, comes to a conclusion, I'd like to, first of all, give a shout out to the tech and music people, the worship people. Oh my gosh. Phenomenal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It takes a village to put a service on like this with such expertise, such competency. Thank you. A lot of hard work. But invite you to coffee hour. Uh, after the service is over today, uh, please immediately ex exit through the foyer. You're encouraged to greet each other outside. Coffee and tea will be served outside in the breezeway between our two buildings. And all who are attending from home or elsewhere are invited to greet each other during the virtual coffee hour on Zoom. The link to join is this morning's email. The password is coffee with a capital C. That makes my heart sing. I love coffee. Yes. And so now we come to our closing words in Chalice Extinguishing. Mm -hmm. As a member of the human race, traveling the great labyrinth of life, may we strive to live our blessing to the world in the beauty of our human diversity, and may love guide our lives with every step and every breath. Blessed be. Thank you. <laughs>